Interesting news this month with around 4,580 homeowners having negative cash sales. Here's a quick look at what may be happening. Hi, I'm Ryan Ong and thanks for joining us on Stacked Homes. This week we're going to take a look at something interesting that's going on. Some 4,580 Singaporeans are seeing negative cash sales. This seems a little bit strange if you consider that we're in an environment where home prices are rising and they should be selling their homes for more. It is quite reasonable for people to be asking, how is it that we're seeing more negative cash sales as home prices go up? We have more exact details, numbers, and other specifics on the Stacked Homes blog. So please do visit our editorial. And in our Stacked Homes blog, we do a more concise and detailed breakdown of the numbers that I'm going to mention here. So to get straight into it, we've heard from the CPF board that there are more Singaporeans who cannot refund the full CPF amount they have after selling their property. This number, 4,580, is higher than the year before when we had around 3,960 people and that in turn was higher than the number of people who faced this in 2018. This may seem contrary to what's happening in the market with home prices rising since 2018 to the present, you would think that fewer people have negative cash sales. Why is it happening? Well, let's start with a quick explanation of what a negative cash sale is for those of you who don't know it. So when you buy a residential property, you can use your CPF ordinary account or your CPF OA to cover some of the costs. Some of the things you can pay for are the down payment, the stamp duties, and the monthly loan repayments. But when you sell your property, you must refund all the CPF money that you use back into your CPF account. This is along with the accrued interest rate of 2.5%. A lot of people ask us why that is. Honestly, this really makes sure that you can't withdraw your CPF money in a roundabout way. Otherwise, you can buy a house using CPF and then sell the house and then pocket the cash, right? So this stops you from doing that. Now, here's an example of a negative cash sale. Say you sold your resale flat for 500,000. That's the amount of money you get. You then pay your outstanding loan of 300,000. So after discharging that loan, that still leaves you with 200,000. But you find that over the years, you've used $225,000 from your CPF to cover the down payment, stamp duties, and so forth. So the full amount has to be refunded from your sale proceeds of $200,000, and this leaves you short by $25,000. As long as the flat was sold at or above market value, you don't need to top up that difference of $25,000, but it does mean that all the remainder of your sale proceeds, the entire $200,000, it has to go all back to your CPF, and it leaves you with $0 cash. You can still use your CPF to buy a property afterward, by the way. This is just problematic for a lot of people because if you have zero cash in hand, you might struggle with making, say, the down payment on a condo. Because if you take a bank loan, at least the first 5% of the property has to be paid in cash. To answer the question, why are more people experiencing this when home prices are rising? Well, there's four likely culprits that we can find. The first contributing factor is quite possibly the rise in ABSD over the past few years. For those of you who don't remember or weren't in the market back then, back in 2011, the ABSD for Singapore citizens only applied on a third property you bought. There was no ABSD on the second. And even then, the amount was just 3%. By 2018, ABSD was 12% for the second property and 15% for the third. At the time that I'm speaking now, it's 17% for the second property and 25% for the third. ABSD, just like the buyer stamp duty, it can be paid through your CPF. So for a new launch condo, you can actually draw from your CPF right away to pay these stamp duties. For resale condos, even though you have to pay the ABSD in cash first, you can get a reimbursement from your CPF afterwards. So this essentially means that most buyers have been paying increasingly higher stamp duties and most people do it through their CPF. Most people do want the reimbursement from CPF because of the large amount of money involved. Unfortunately, because you can pay the buyer stamp duty and an additional buyer stamp duty with your CPF, this can remove some of the sting and this increases a buyer's willingness to go ahead and tolerate these higher stamp duties at times. When buyers pay more stamp duties with their CPF, you end up with a higher risk of negative cash sales. For example, if you were to pay a 12% ABSD on a $1.5 million condo, that's around an added $180,000 that you're taking out of your CPF that's accruing at 2.5% per annum. The second factor is the monthly loan repayments. You can make monthly loan repayments 
through your CPF, whether it's a HDB flat or a private condo. It is a little bit ironic. We know that HDB loan rates have been much higher than private bank rates. In 2021, for instance, the average bank loan rate was just around 1.3% whereas the HDB loan rate has been 2.6% for a long time. However, not every homeowner has been quick to refinance to take advantage of lower rates. There is a lot of anxiety in doing so if you're on an HDB loan. That's because you can switch from an HDB loan to a bank loan, but you cannot switch from a bank loan to an HDB loan. Some buyers just bite the bullet, they tolerate the higher loan rates. And there's many reasons for this, such as knowing that if they cannot meet their mortgage, for instance, HDB is likely to be more lenient than the bank. There was also a reasonable expectation by some borrowers a while back that at some point the bank loan rates would go past the HDB loan rates of 2.6% and that does make sense because back in the 90s in fact bank loan rates were closer to 4% but of course no one had any idea of knowing that after the global financial crisis before the interest rates could stabilize COVID-19 would happen and then it would continue to keep interest rates low and finally there's a third category of homeowners for whom all this is admittedly a little bit confusing and they don't want to get into it so they just don't really pay attention to the interest rate that they're paying. It's much easier to lose track of the interest rate when all your monthly loan repayments are coming from CPF, so you're not conscious, for instance, that they are creeping higher and higher. Some homeowners don't actively refinance, and then after a very long period, such as a decade, they end up spending more from their CPF than they thought they had. The third factor is home buyers really trying to use as much of their CPF as possible, trying to squeeze as much as they can out of it to cover every little possible cost. They cover the buyer's stamp duty with it. They cover the additional buyer's stamp duty if it's applicable. They want to cover their legal fees with it. They cover the down payment with it. They cover the home loan repayments for months and months for years on end. This creates a situation where buyers end up over relying on their CPF and taking it to the degree where by the time they sell, they end up having to refund a huge portion back into CPF. This is one of the reasons, by the way, we suggest that you don't always just rely on your CPF to service the home loan because it's quite likely that you'll lose track of the amount of CPF that you're actually spending. Now, our fourth point applies to resale properties. This is because properties bought from a developer have the same price and valuation. But when you're buying a resale property, the seller's price may not match the valuation. The seller's price could be higher than the valuation. For example, if you're buying a resale condo, the seller may want 1.3 million, but then the actual valuation is just 1.2 million. Now, when you take a bank loan for your condo, it is capped at 75% of the price or valuation, whichever is lower. So in our example of the condo, if the seller's price is 1.3 million and the valuation is 1.2 million, you get to borrow 75% of 1.2 million. For many buyers, what they want is for a bank that accepts a valuation as close to the selling price as possible. They look out for banks that give them the highest possible valuation. For example, they may seek out a bank that's willing to take a valuation of 1.25 million. That will increase their loan quantum to as high as 937,500. But this has two effects. The first is they ultimately are borrowing more because they're looking for a bigger loan quantum. And of course, the more you borrow coupled with interest rates, the more you end up paying from your CPF. But the other factor is that this can drive you towards a bank that is not currently the cheapest on the market. The bank that accepts a higher valuation on your home may not be the bank that's charging the lowest interest rate right now. This is a little bit of a double whammy here because buyers are inclined to both take a bigger loan and possibly pay more for that loan. It's also worth noting that in 2021, and in fact for the foreseeable year ahead, with the property market being on a high, buyers are quite exuberant and sellers are quite confident. There is a likelihood that we are going to see bigger discrepancies between a seller's asking price and the actual valuations. As a quick conclusion to this, you can see that it is very easy to lose track of how much of your CPF you're really spending. And for owner investors who want to upgrade, we really do suggest you use a mix of cash and CPF. For example, covering your down payment with CPF, but maybe using both cash and CPF to handle the monthly home loans later on down the road. This is all really to keep you conscious of the amount that you're spending. And when you're conscious of how much of your CPF you're using, you will minimize the risk of having a negative cash sale later. This is also important if your income falls later on and your CPF contributions become lower because you do end up with the risk that you use up more of your CPF that you can manage uh, given your now lower income. For more on this as it unfolds, do 
follow us on the Stacked Homes page. Do check out our editorial. We have a more precise breakdown here. In the meantime, if you have any questions about this, comments about this, do put it in the comments box below. Let us know what other topics you'd like us to talk about as well so we can cover that. And of course, as always, please do like and subscribe. It does mean a lot to us and that allows us to give you a notification whenever we have something new up for you. I'm Ryan Ong with Stacked Homes. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you.